Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defense and world affairs. Once again, the world witnesses a war launched in response to a terrorist atrocity. The Hamas have indiscriminately murdered in a terrorist manner uh, women, children, the Holocaust survivors. Israel's made it clear that it wants to complete the military directive, getting rid of Hamas rule. Mike and I are joined by a former military intelligence commander to address the key military questions about what's happening in Israel and Gaza. Also on SITREP, a gas pipeline and undersea data cable between Estonia and Finland are damaged. If it is proven uh, that this is a deliberate attack uh, on Allies' critical undersea infrastructure, it will be met by a united and determined uh, response from uh, NATO. And the UK's next generation kit for data-driven warfare. Trinity is uh, going to deliver its broadband on the battlefield. If you compare it to the throughput of the current system Falcon, uh, it's 100 times more. Zitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Mike, hi. Um, we've spoken about the starts and ends of many military conflicts over the years, but what we've just witnessed in Israel and Gaza feels particularly shocking. Yes, it does. And um, it was designed, as a number of people are saying, by Hamas to create outrage, to create a reaction, and they assume an overreaction, because they're now trying to create, a, I think, a more generalised war in the Middle East. They probably don't know what they've started. But in a way, now that the Israelis don't really quite know what they're getting into. I mean, Mark Regev, who's the uh, advisor to the Netanyahu, the prime minister, he said, look, we cannot go back to the way Gaza was. Whatever comes out of this, Gaza will have to be different. But he doesn't know, and nobody else knows quite how different. So the Israelis are on this road. They don't know where it leads. They only know that they've now got to go there. Israel has declared this a war, but it's not a country versus country fight per se. What kind of war do you think this will be? Well, it'll be a war of occupation. The Israelis will move in. They'll control most or all of Gaza. They're taking on an insurgency. What we don't know is how fiercely Hamas will fight. It's possible that Hamas will disappear. They'll go through the tunnels and, and disappear into Sinai and try to live to fight another day and then come back in a few months' time. Or they may try to make this a sort of last, da- last chance fight, uh, some great sort of martyrdom, which they hope will inflame a more general uh, offensive against Israel elsewhere. And we'll, we'll know about that within the next couple of weeks, I think. Well, what we want to do today is explain the military situation and answer the big military questions about this war. Let's bring in Colonel Philip Ingram, a former senior army intelligence officer. Uh, Philip, good to have you on SITREP today. Uh, First big question, how was this able to happen? Well, that's the one thing that I think the Israelis in the world are examining because the Israelis have got uh, one of the best intelligence organizations in the world. I think there's a number of issues here. You know, Hamas have been watching how Israeli gather, uh, the Israelis gather their intelligence for a long time. They've been planning this for a long time and they've done it in what intelligence terms you call the noise. So they've been feeding the, the Israelis uh, what the Israelis want to hear in many cases um, to, to keep them busy in different areas and you know, the suggestions that uh, Hamas wanted to um, create a a better civilian infrastructure and and focus on that and everything else, whilst they've had their classified behind closed doors planning teams, probably and possibly helped by individuals or or countries from outside uh, and kept their operational security um, very, very tight indeed in doing that. And I think there's been a a bit of an issue inside Israel because the Israelis have had a bit of groupthink that will have come into their intelligence organizations, uh, as well as relying on too, too much on technology and not bringing you know, an all source picture together. So it's showing some fundamental flaws in the, the Israeli intelligence machinery. And this is a lesson that they will not allow to happen again. You said they were feeding Israel what they wanted to hear. What were they telling them, do you think? Well, what, what they were doing was they were suggesting that Hamas was going to focus on um, you know, the civil infrastructure, on, on you know, the sorts of things that a potential government of a state in waiting uh, would be doing and that that suited what um, Israel wanted to hear from a political perspective. Mike, why now? 
Uh, now, because they could do it, I mean, I think as Philip said, I mean, this has been a long time in the planning, at least a year, maybe two years. And this has come from somebody who was captured in the attack on Saturday, a Hamas individual, who has said that they thought that the Israelis were too distracted by their own internal problems, their own constitutional crisis, and this beginning of what might turn out to be a third intifada on the West Bank. And so in general, there was a sense they'd been planning this for a long time, and they thought that that suddenly the the events were lining up in their favour around about now, and they, as it were, pressed the go button for this operation, looking at the situation inside Israel itself. Of course, they've made a very big mistake in doing that because Israel, at times like this, comes together like no other country, and that's exactly what's happened. Israel can become a military player very, very quickly, quicker than anybody else in the world, probably. And Philip, um, why um, did Hamas do this attack? What was their strategic objective, do you think? Well, this is where, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll expand on what Mike was saying there, because I think we haven't seen all of this yet. You know, the, the, the Hamas have spent a long time planning this. They have almost certainly had external help doing it. They understand the Israeli tactics very well, and they know that by poking the Israeli bear in the way that they have done will cause um, an Israeli overreaction um, and into the ground. And and, they, and Hamas have learned so many lessons from battles that they've had with the Israelis beforehand. You know, the, the, the importance of asymmetric warfare, the use of tunnels, improvised explosive devices from the, the Battle of Janine in, in 2002 uh, and, and, uh, and subsequent battles. So you know, they, they've disappeared very quickly back into um, Gaza uh, and integrated amongst the people. They're hiding amongst the people, knowing that Israel's activities are going to um, kill um, Palestinian civilians. So they're, they're using that in the information sphere. And once Israel goes in on the ground, they will have fixed them in those places. Uh, and this is where you know, th there's been no clear end state. And you don't put such a complex plan together where you're attacking from the air and you're attacking from the land and you're attacking from the sea. Um, if, if you don't have clear objectives and a clear end state. And that hasn't come out yet. And that's the worrying bit, because that could be bringing in uh, and opening up a second front, possibly with Hezbollah from Lebanon, um, and, and possibly other elements coming into it. And that's where it gets really, really worrying. But what, why do you think Hamas, Hamas would want to provoke a war? How does it actually advance their cause? Well, it, it, it doesn't, um, apart from um, you know, lash, lash it, lashing out at Israel and uh, trying to um, get the, um, the, the Arab communities around the world to uh, polarize against Israel. Now, you know, Hamas were getting upset that there was um, improving uh, relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE and elsewhere. But it also suits you know, a number of other people around the world. And you know, people put this as conspiracy theories, um, but, but you know, it's taken our, our eyes collectively off what's going on inside Ukraine from an international mm. perspective. And you know, Israel is already starting to ask for ammunition. Um, and when you get into this dilemma of you know, Ukraine asking for 155 millimeter artillery ammunition and Israel asking for 155 millimeter artillery ammunition from the United States, who are in a very difficult political position in the run up to the next presidential election, there is a dilemma that's in there. And that plays into the hands of Vladimir Putin very, very well indeed. Yeah, and if we look now at Israel's strategic objective, we've got their own words for that. This is Israeli Army Colonel Jonathan Conricus. To achieve a situation whereby Hamas will no longer have any military capacity to kill or hurt Israeli civilians, whereby Hamas cannot govern the Gaza Strip. Those are our aims. We're in for a very long and difficult war. Mike, how long do you think it will last? Uh, well, this will go through uh, months and probably uh, uh, years before there's a new situation. Certainly, this won't be a matter of weeks. So I think we've got to assume it'll go into next year with the Israelis occupying Gaza. And then the question is, well, what happens then? And are the Israelis running a counterinsurgency operation that they can't get out of in Gaza, which seems quite likely just at the moment? So we'll be talking about this situation, I think, for at least the, the, the rest of this year and well into next year. 
Um, I hope that that's all we'll be talking about and not a more generalized Middle East conflagration, as Philip said, with the Israelis fighting on two or three fronts, on the Lebanon front and on the West Bank, and and then with a a more generalized uh, grumbling war uh, with Iran and possibly drawing in Syria and Iraq. Because even yesterday, there were groups and governments in Syria, Iraq, in Yemen, um, all of whom were saying they will join the fight. They didn't say what they meant by that, but they will join the fight if Israel uh, moves into Gaza and if the Americans help them. Well, Israel will certainly move into Gaza. How much American help they'll have, we'll see. But there are lots of groups around the region, and in some cases, governmental statements, which are saying this fight will be our fight. And we'll see what that turns out to mean by the end of this year. Philip, uh, Mike said earlier about Hamas potentially just disappearing down that warren of tunnels. Is eliminating them a a realistic strategic objective? Not really, um, because they can't blend straight back into the population again and you know, pop up as you know, still Hamas at some stage in the future. Um, and this is where it's very difficult. And you know, from a military objective, the language was quite clear there, and it's to eliminate Hamas. What Israel needs to do now is make sure that they keep that division between what they're doing against Hamas, recognising that they're hiding amongst the, the Palestinian population and the innocent Palestinians are going to suffer in this. But they have to keep that distinction between Hamas and the Palestinians and you try and somehow or other as they uh, and it's quite clear from the language that they are going to attack in in the ground and they are going to occupy Gaza but what Israel needs to do is try and keep that clear line between what they're doing against Hamas and try and do something that's positive to try and help the Palestinian people that's virtually impossible to do especially with the polarization that we've got across the world the Hamas will try and get this and the world to see this as a Palestinian thing instead of an Israel against Hamas peace. Alex, the, Alex the, Younger this, made the point this morning. He said that um, it's not a good idea to do what your enemy wants you to do, and that's mm, exactly yeah. what the Israelis are doing at the moment. They're doing what the enemy yeah, yeah, exactly, and, that, and that's that's why I think that's why I think the Hamas know what they're doing. They, yeah. they, mm. they, they, this is but, this has been well planned. But what else? Would, what else could they do, really? Because I mean, no, that's right. uh, and they will have been briefed that this is what Hamas wants you to do, so don't do it. So is, what, Israel, what Israel, Israel have got no options. They they have to go in on the ground. But you, but yeah. when when they go in on the ground, you know, the the Battle of Janine g- gave Hamas some really really big lessons, and that was two thousand two. They, they they can fix them in place. That's when Hezbollah, and this this is what we need to watch for. That's when Hezbollah from Lebanon will start to uh, come in once once the Israelis have committed themselves in a massive way into Gaza then mm. that gives Hezbollah an opportunity a to chance. come in from southern southern Lebanon um, yeah. now Hezbollah are only going to do that if if they, there's the possibility of then um, wider support potentially coming in from Iran um, uh, Syria and and elsewhere Mike, um, the US uh, sent an aircraft carrier uh, with a second due to head to the region um, what would they use it for what's it going to do? Well, it's uh, useful to have a carrier battle group in that part of the world anyway. I mean, the USS Gerald Ford is the biggest carrier in the world. And it isn't just a, a piece of military hardware. It's also a, uh, it's a major hospital. It's a, a command center, an intelligence gathering center, um, a humanitarian aid distribu- distribution center if necessary. It can do lots of things. And so there's, there's, in one sense, it's a signal to the region that the Americans will not stand back and that the Americans will become involved if they think they have to at any level. And then it's a useful asset to have. And if certainly if you've got two carrier battle groups in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, to be honest, you could start a war with two carry battle groups. The, the, the amount of power, sheer military hardware that that deploys is pretty considerable. So it gives the Americans options. It's a, it's a sensible thing to do. It's not particularly escalatory. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a utility move which gives the Americans um, a range of possibilities depending on how the unfolding crisis develops and all of the, the things that will happen which will be hard to predict. At least you've got a sort of a fallback option if you've got a couple of carrier battle groups standing offshore. And Philip, how, how effective a deterrent can those battle groups be? Um, against Hamas and against what's going to happen on the ground from a tactical perspective, not in any way, shape or form, but from a, a more operational or strategic perspective in um, you know, suggesting to other countries that uh, they don't want to get involved. Th- this is significant. This is a very, very dangerous time. Israel is ready to fight in two fronts, yeah. but uh, if that turns into three fronts and then is, can the international community support fight on two or three fronts? That's why the aircraft carrier groups have been moved in to, to basically turn around to 
Lebanon and say, don't you dare let this happen. Overall, it also sends um, a clear message in the information domain. So you, part of all of this, a really big part of all of this is what's happening in the information sphere. And this is sending a very, very clear uh, message in that that um, you know, America is serious. And of course, we've heard um, discussion that the UK might be sending um, HMS Queen Elizabeth. And we've got uh, our permanent aircraft carrier in that part of the Mediterranean in British Forces Cyprus. Uh, yeah, you mentioned HMS Queen Elizabeth there, and nothing confirmed as we're speaking now. Um, Mike, what do you think this means to the UK and the rest of the world? It means that we can't be indifferent. Um, if this is going to be a, a, a bigger Middle East crisis, and it looks as if it is, um, we don't know how big, that, that Britain can't stand out of this, if only because the United States is taking it so seriously and we really need to stand with the Americans at the moment. The, the big problem for us is that we've got our hands full um, with the European crisis in Ukraine just in terms of resources as well as our it, attention. Um, and so it's, it's it, you know, the government needs this like a hole in the head, but there you are. That's the nature of international politics. Uh, and Phillips, um, some in the US are asking if the US might send in a military team to rescue hostages in Gaza. How likely do you think that is? Um, I think it's a possibility. You know, the, the US will have special forces on the ground working closely with the Israeli special forces. They, they work closely together anyway, um, and they will be planning uh, and, and you know, at the very least helping to plan to understand where the hostages are, what the art of the possibility is, because just because you've got special forces on the ground, you know where the hostages are, doesn't mean that um, it's going to be any safer getting in to get them out. Um, it may be safer to, to leave them there if you can monitor uh, and, and ensure that they're safe. Um, this is not a good time for the hostages. Um, I, I Politically, I, I think it would um, raise it to another level if we started to see um, you know, diff different groupings uh, going in to Gaza to rescue their, 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 their nationals that are in there. But um, it, it's, it's early days. Anything could happen at the moment. Philip Ingram, it's great to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. This is Sidrath. Well, events in the Middle East have overshadowed some important events in Europe, starting with what could be an attack against the infrastructure of NATO countries. The Baltic connector gas pipeline between Finland and Estonia is ruptured. Norway seismologists reporting they detected a probable explosion. An undersea telecoms cable between the countries has also been damaged, but it is some distance away. And Mike, what do you make of it all? I think it's part of a, a general Russian strategy to create another winter campaign. In a way, the Russians are going to do more of the same that they did last year, which is to try to bring Ukraine to a standstill over the winter and also worry the Europeans that there is an energy crisis as a result of this war. I'm absolutely certain that it was the Russians who blew up the Baltic Sea pipeline last year, and I'm pretty sure it'll turn out to be the Russians who are responsible for this probable explosion. It does look like an act of sabotage. This is not the most important one, but it's an indication of the fact that they're probably working on a number of pipelines and seeing which, which ones they can interfere with in some way. And the NATO Secretary General says if it is shown to be an attack, there will be a united and determined response. What in reality does that mean? I think the reality is that you've just got to patrol the pipelines as, as well as we can, just look after them. I mean, Stuart Peach, when he was uh, Chief of the Defence Staff, was warning about this seven or eight years ago. He said, we've got a new front in our competition with Russia, which is what it then was, only a competition, in terms of pipeline security. So I think we'll have to do a lot more of that. Whether it gets to any form of as we you know shooting war whether we try to uh, at attack a ship which we think is in an act of sabotage would be a, a completely different ball game and i'm sure we won't get to that but that's always the danger that in protecting pipelines we'll end up competing with ships that are drifting around looking like fishing vessels or spy vessels and in fact are sending submersibles down to sabotage pipelines if we catch them doing it of course then it's it's possible that there would be a, an exchange of some sort but i don't think we're likely to get to that in the the near term. 
And it's very timely that the UK's new underwater survey ship, RFA Proteus, mm. has just been formally dedicated, isn't it? Yes, it uh, came out of Campbell Air Shipyard where it was being um, re reworked. Um, it was a P&O ship originally, and we've got a second one on the way. I don't think that'll be ready until next year, but I think we might need more. NATO will need more, but the Proteus looks like a very good investment in swift adaptation. Uh, you know, full marks to the MOD and Camel Airs for doing that. So we've got we've got exactly the right sort of ship, um, but we and NATO will need rather more of them in the future, I think. Let's pick up on Ukraine itself. Uh, offensive operations from both sides in recent days. Is it changing much? Uh, not fundamentally. Um, the Russians are trying to run offensives all around the front, and there was b very big attacks in the last 48 hours on Avdivka, south of Bakhmut, and they've been repelled, but at some cost, I understand. And the Ukrainians are still pushing southwards from Orykiv in the south towards Tokmak. That's a really big offensive for them. If the, if the Ukrainians can take Tokmak, then things will begin to change more quickly. The Ukrainians think that they're through most of the Russian defensive lines, but of course, more lines are being dug ahead of them as they as they move further south so there's nothing dramatic on the map but the battle itself is reaching that critical stage of of attrition you know have the ukrainians done enough to actually make the russians crack in some significant ways in the south and are the russians doing enough to make it till the bad weather which would be about a month away now and they can not relax but at least they they know that the ukrainians will have a harder time when the weather turns bad however the weather in Ukraine, I'm, a, I'm an expert these days on Ukrainian weather. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> the, the, the weather in Ukraine, it, there will be, if, if it works the way as it normally does, there'll be a, a wet season um, at the uh, around about November, December, but then quite quickly turn cold. And when it turns cold again, then the weather will freeze quite, uh, the, the, the ground will freeze uh, quite quickly and it'll be quite good for offensive operations. So the, the, the autumn will pose a pause and then we'll see how cold the weather gets over the winter. Yeah, we were talking earlier, Mike, about um, how uh, Vladimir Putin would be quite happy about what's happening in Israel and Gaza because it's diverting attention away from Ukraine. But at the NATO defence ministers meeting, there have been more pledges of military equipment and assistance. The UK's pledge worth £100 million. What's the reality of how much difference it can all make? Yeah, the uh, Russian um, press this morning, as reported through the BBC, um, was interesting because there's quite a lot of press comment in Moscow saying that Putin has said that this is quite useful for their special military operation because it will stretch America's abilities to supply two allies at once. And they're saying, you know, we, we the Russian can keep going on our own resources, but Ukraine can only keep going because it's supported by the outside and the outside won't be able to support it so well. I think that might be a bit over optimistic from Russia's point of view. I don't think Ukraine's not going to suffer because of this in the short term. Term. But in the longer term, I, I, into next year, the idea that the United States has got its hands full with a, a Middle East crisis and that the Republican Party, who are sceptical about, or part of the Republican Party are sceptical about aid to Ukraine, are not at all sceptical about aid to Israel, um, that actually might turn out to be a genuine problem for mm. those of us who support Ukraine, not in the short term, but sometime into next year. Well, the war in Ukraine has perhaps given us the clearest idea yet of what the future of warfare might be. A combination of the kind of trench fighting seen in World War I, together with both low and high technology drones providing surveillance, targeting and strike capability. Even the oldest and simplest forms of combat will become data driven. But the kind of battle winning data of today, such as live video feeds, takes up huge bandwidth. And that is where Trinity comes in. In a couple of years, the army will start using this new wide area network that can connect battlefields to headquarters, ships and planes around the world. Major General Richard Spencer from Defence Digital has been explaining the system to Simon Newton. Trinity is uh, going to deliver us broadband on the battlefield. And by that, what I mean, it's about connecting big headquarters to ensure that they can share the right information and data to make better decisions from commanders. But also what Trinity will do is we are looking to put an under armour capability in one of our armoured vehicles is to be able to take that uh, amount of data that we now need to do, because there is more data in the battlefield, take it further forward. Principally, it will be used in the land environment, principally by the army, but it will also be useful for the Air Force at deployed operating bases. 
forces. Um, and if I give you a, a sort of army example, if you've got a tactical contact going on forward, which will be on combat net radio, the sort of things that we see in uh, the war movies, uh, what will be happening behind that is that that information will be going into lower level headquarters and Trinity will be able to suck all of that information into higher level headquarters and allow the commanders higher up to make decisions about how they reinforce a fight or how they make decisions to allow things like full motion video and recce activity to be sent further forward. Is it effectively a, a bigger, faster pipe for all of this data? Uh, that's one way of looking at it. So it's, it's bigger and faster, which is good. If you compare it to the throughput of the current system Falcon, it's 100 times more. Yeah, so it's a significant amount of data that can be pushed across the battlefield. But then again, there is far more data. If you look at what uh, the Ukrainians are doing and if you look at what the army's doing with its new program, there will be far more unattended aerial vehicles all across the battlefield. What this will allow is that to be either sent as analysed data or where needed could be streamed as full motion video. But it will also be more resilient. So if we're being attacked uh, in the cyber domain, so being attacked through electronic warfare or through other means, or if we're in GPS denied environments, uh, what Trinity will do through a mesh network is to ensure that those headquarters are connected and even in the most challenging situations and allow the information to get to the right place for commanders to make the right decision. So I've got a mesh network at home. I mean, it's obviously a very, very high-tech, state-of-the-art version of that, but I guess an un you, I can understand what you mean. So there's, there's nodes around. Yes. Yeah, so Trinity itself will have a number of different nodes and a number of different variants, be it, be it things that are on uh, pallets and in pelly cases that can be moved around and will, won't be particularly mobile through on the back of a truck, which can't go too far forward in the battle space, but will also uh, eventually be under armour in our mechanised infantry vehicle. Uh, once it's under armour, it will be able to move much quicker and will be able to provide information services much further forward to enable commanders much further forward to have the right information to make decisions. And you were saying that Boxer is the vehicle that is most likely to be put into on the, feet, on the battlefield? Yes, so the mechanised infantry uh, vehicle, uh, which is the Boxer vehicle, you know, we're designing it with uh, Team Vigilant led by BAE uh, now. We just, that's what's just gone on contract. Uh, they'll be looking to work that through with the first variants, which will be the ones in the Pelly cases and on the trucks available in 2025-2026. And then once the uh, mechanised infantry programme has got the right vehicles available, because we want to get them to soldiers first of all, and then we'll use them for comms, uh, these will follow on a couple of years later. You were telling me you, you, Gulf War is your first sort of operation. It so was, you yes. now in terms of the data load on soldiers, I mean, the, the danger obviously is that they're overwhelmed with data in, in the modern kind of battlefield yes. space. How much data is, is involved in modern kind of warfare? So modern warfare relies on data. Uh, you know, if you look at Ukraine, uh, you can take many different lessons from Ukraine, but it's certainly looking at more data, data that is available to make the decisions. The key thing that we're try we need to do is not only provide that data to different locations, but provide the tools and the analysis so that commanders don't get overwhelmed by the data deluge that you get from having those bits of data. So whilst Trinity will do a really good job of allowing lots of bits of data to move around, up to and including things like full motion video, uh, what we need to layer on top of that is the tools to allow commanders and their staffs, staff to make sure that they can uh, analyse that data and use it to make better decisions. And you're a signaller as well. I mean, the young signallers, do they have to become more tech savvy and more specialised to use this sort of thing? So it's designed to be more, more easy to use, uh, but as it's more easy to use, you do need uh, signallers who've got the intelligence to understand when it goes wrong how to troubleshoot it. Uh, so we've got to get the right balance between educating our signallers how a wide area network operates so that when it doesn't go well, and I'm sure it will work will go well, but when it doesn't, because the enemy always has a vote, they can think through the problems that come up and they can look at the different alternate ways of doing it. Uh, so for example on the current Falcon system uh, we've deployed that in a number of different areas but we've also connected it back to the UK over the internet and that's just bright young signalers understanding how communications and digital services work uh, and what we want to be able to do with this new system is allow that to happen where it's appropriate. So if you're a young major in the army maybe a company commander and you're, you're in a contact with your guys 
you would be able to then send more information back and receive more information. So at the company commander level, you probably wouldn't have much more, uh, but it's potentially at the battalion commander and above, absolutely you'd have more information available. Uh, and as you said earlier, that data deluge, you've got to be really careful, particularly at the front end of the fight, uh, that you're not overloading people. If that company commander goes static and he's preparing for, or sorry, he or she is preparing for their next contact in the planning phase, what you will look to do is potentially put a Trinity node further forward to them so that they could then do more planning. They might get some video feeds or some photographs of their next objective. They can then plan on it. They can then go back and use combat net radio, much lower connectivity, but very immediate uh, voice and limited data to do the fight. So Trinity is more in the planning rather than in the fighting, but it will allow um, commanders at a higher level to make good decisions whilst uh, those at the uh, tactical level are doing the fighting. Major General Richard Spencer of Defence Digital. Uh, Mike, if Trinity lives up to the expectation, how much difference could it make for Britain's forces? Yes, I mean, every generation of uh, comms uh, threatens to make that sort of difference. Um, it goes back to the Duke of Wellington, you know, the other side of the hill. You have to know what's going on on the other side mm. of the hill. And if it works, of course, it will make a big difference. I mean, sometimes you despair at the, the fact that you're constantly chasing the end of the rainbow in terms of information in warfare, because information, as Richard Spencer said, is absolutely vital. And it's the end of the rainbow, chasing, chasing, chasing. You never get there. The comfort is that you, you know you'll never get there you just have to be better than the opposition at, at the chase you, know, you yeah. don't have to con you don't really have to control all this stuff you just have to be better than they are at controlling all of this stuff and that that danger of, of data overload for commanders um not necessarily a new concept then um are there tried and tested ways of managing it Yes, I think, and the principles there, I think that uh, uh, General Spencer was talking about, are, are really uh, what would what we mean. You you can't overload any level of command with information. So the idea is that the data has to be um, uh, coordinated and synthesised at the right level, and the, um, the 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 soldier or the officer, whatever level, has got to be able to know what questions to ask and then know that they'll get the answers. It's no good as we're throwing data at any command level and just letting them work it out. You've got to hold the data somewhere and then wait for them to ask you the questions. And so the key issue, it still goes back to good commanders, the key issue is having commanders at all levels, from the captain upwards, who are intelligent enough and well-trained enough to know what questions are that they need to have answered. They need to ask the right questions, and then the data will download them the answer to that question as we currently understand it from all of the information that we've got. That's the essence of it. And I think um, General Spencer was absolutely right in what he said about that. Of course, it's easier said than done, but it still comes back to the training and the battlefield awareness of the individual man or woman. Professor Michael Clark, thank you so much. It's been great to speak to you again. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. We'll be back with another sit rep next Thursday. If you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfps.com slash sit rep or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.